The Imitation of Christ of Thomas Akempis is a 15th century work of spiritual advice. Although much of it is uh, specifically for those called to live a consecrated single life in a religious rule with the particular forms of uh, self-denial and renunciation of the world involved in that. So much of it is applicable to Christians in whatever state of life they are living in the world by God's providence. So hopefully these uh, few readings from the book will prove helpful. This is from book two, On the Inner Life. The kingdom of God is within you, says our Lord. Turn to the Lord with all your heart and give up this worthless world. Then your soul will find rest. Learn indifference to all that lies outside you and devote yourself to the life within and you will see the kingdom of God coming in you. The kingdom of God means finding our peace and our joy in the Holy Spirit, and the worldly cannot receive it. Christ will come to you and show you his comfort, if you will prepare for him a worthy house in your heart. All his loveliness and his glory he keeps for the house of the soul, and there it is that he takes his pleasure. Many are the times he comes to the man who lives the inward life, and to him he grants sweet conversation, glad comfort, great peace and amazing friendship. O faithful soul, prepare your heart for this bridegroom, so that he may be willing to come to you and dwell within you. For he says, If a man has any love for me, he will be true to my word, and we will both come to him and make our continual abode with him. Make room for Christ then and deny entrance to all others. When you have Christ, you are rich and have all you require. He himself will faithfully provide for you and supply you with everything so that you have no need to look to men. Men soon change, and it is not long before they fail you. But Christ abides forever and stands by you immovably right to the end. Mortal men are weak, and so you should not rely on anyone, not even a good person and one you are fond of, nor should it cause you any great distress if people sometimes resist and contradict you. Those who are with you today can oppose you tomorrow. They swing right round like the wind. Rest your whole confidence on God and let him be your fear and your love. He will reply on your behalf and in his wisdom do what is best for you. You have an everlasting city, but not here. Wherever you go, you are a stranger and an exile, nor will you ever find rest unless you are one with Christ in your heart. Why do you look round about you here when this is not the place where you are meant to find your rest? Your home should be in heavenly places, and you should be looking on all earthly things as transient. All things pass away, and you are passing with them. Take care not to cling to them, or you may be entangled and perish. Let the Most High God take care of you, and see that your prayers are directed Christwards without ceasing. If you are not able to contemplate high and heavenly things, rest in the passion of Christ and be content to dwell within his sacred wounds. If you resort with devotion to the wounds and precious scars of Jesus, you will find great comfort in trouble. 
you will not mind so much if men despise you, and you will find it easy to bear when they speak against you. Christ, too, was despised by men in this world, and in his greatest need was abandoned by friends and followers and left to face humiliation. Christ was prepared to suffer and to be despised. Dare you raise any complaint? Christ had enemies and detractors. Do you expect to find everyone a friend and benefactor? How can you be rewarded for endurance if you have never met anything that has to be endured? If you are not prepared to suffer opposition, how can you be the friend of Christ? You must endure with Christ and for the sake of Christ if you wish to reign with Christ. If you had once entered completely into the heart of Jesus and had tasted just a little of his burning love, then you would care nothing about your own convenience or inconvenience. Instead, you would rejoice when insult was offered you. For the love of Jesus makes a man unmindful of himself. A man who loves Jesus and the truth, who is delivered from undisciplined desires and really lives the inward life, can turn to God with nothing to hold him back. In spirit he can rise beyond himself and rest in peace and joy. When a man can value all things as they really are, and not as they are said or thought to be, then he is really wise and taught by God, not men. The man who knows how to walk the road of the inward life and set little store by things outside himself has no need of special places nor set times to perform his exercises of devotion. The man who is living the inward life can soon still all his thoughts, because he never abandons himself entirely to outward things. No physical toil is any obstacle to him, nor any activity that must be performed. He can adjust himself to anything that comes. The man whose inner life is well-ordered and disciplined does not care about men's perverse, strange ways, for a man is only hindered and distracted from God insofar as he involves himself and in what goes on around him. If you were in a good state and thoroughly purified, everything would help to secure your good and contribute to your progress. The reason why you are so often angry and upset is because you are not yet completely dead to your own interests and separated from all that is earthly. There is nothing that pollutes and entangles the human heart so much as an unpurged love for things that have been created. Only if you refuse outward comforts will you be able to glimpse the things of heaven and often know the inward joy. On submitting humbly, you are not to mind greatly who is for you or against you, but take good care that God is with you in everything you do. Make sure you have a good conscience and God will watch over you. And if God is prepared to support a man, no one else's unpleasantness can hurt him. If you know how to suffer in silence, you will undoubtedly find the Lord delivering you. He knows the time and the method by which he will save you, and so you should leave yourself to him. It is God's nature to help and to rescue from humiliation of every kind. It is often a great help to us in maintaining our humility if others are aware of our failings and point them out. If a man humbles himself when he has done wrong, he soon wins others over and appeases those who are angry with him. It is the humble man whom God protects and delivers, 
the humble whom he loves and comforts. It is to the humble that he turns a willing ear and grants his grace in abundance. And after he has been downtrodden, he lifts him up to glory. It is to the humble that he reveals his secrets, and he lovingly draws him and calls him to him. If a humble man is humiliated, his peace is not disturbed, because he does not live by the world, his life depends on God. Only when you think yourself of less importance than everybody else, may you consider that you have made some progress. On the good man who spreads peace. Live in peace yourself, and then you can bring peace to others. A peaceable man does more good than a learned one. A man who is prey to strong emotions turns even what is good to evil and is ready to believe evil, whereas the good, peaceable man turns everything to good. A man who lives in peace does not suspect anyone, but a discontented, unsettled man is tormented by all kinds of suspicions. He is not quiet himself, and he does not allow others to be quiet. He often says what he should not, and neglects to do what he should. He is aware of others' obligations, but fails to observe his own. Turn your indignation on yourself in the first place. Then you can, with some justice, turn it on your neighbour. You are skilled in finding excuses and in putting a good complexion on your own actions, and yet you are unwilling to listen to the excuses of others. It would be more reasonable to accuse yourself and excuse your brother. If you want others to bear with you, you must bear with others. See how far you are still from the true love and humility that does not know how to be angry or offended with anyone except itself. It is no great achievement to be able to live with good, gentle people. Everyone naturally finds that a pleasant thing. Every one of us likes to have an easy life and prefers people that agree with him. But to be able to live with unresponsive, unpleasant or undisciplined people is a sign of great grace. It deserves praise and is a deed nobly done. There are some people who live in peace themselves and are also at peace with others. There are some who neither enjoy peace in their own lives nor leave others in peace. They are a burden to other people and even more of a burden to themselves. There are others who not only keep themselves in peace, but are always ready to guide others back to peace. Yet in this wretched life of ours, peace must depend not on freedom from distress, but on the ability to suffer, submit to suffering humbly. It is the man who knows best how to endure who will preserve the deepest peace. It is this sort of man that overcomes himself and is master of the world, that is the friend of Christ and the heir of heaven. This was from the uh, 1963 translation by Miss Betty I. Nott, The Imitation of Christ. <laughs> 